Hello and welcome. We're about to encounter a massive and grand struggle for reality itself. Let's begin very briefly with the experience of pornography. The lure of pornography has been disastrous in very many ways in our culture. Some people have escaped its attractions because, however strong the lure of sex, watching bad actors engage in impersonal fake belief and misrepresent beauty as abuse isn't at all compelling. But artificial intelligence has begun to produce a different kind of fake belief, digital representations of people that look real but aren't. And these enticing, charming, realistic, compelling and soon to be compulsive digital representations can be programmed to offer to meet our deepest needs, whatever we think they are. You may already have received fake emails from a member of your family or one of your friends, someone in your contact list, telling you in unconvincing American slang they've been robbed and they need cash urgently, send it at once. But soon we will be presented with their real faces and their real voices, digitally remastered, speaking in their own idiom, lifted from the internet, telling us untruths with sophisticated digital conviction. We're standing on the edge of a new digital revolution, but one that will reach down into every part of our personal and political lives to bring convincing, manipulative and addictive fakery. At the centre of this is a struggle for reality itself. The importance of Jesus claiming to be and presenting himself as the Logos, the way, the truth and the life has never been in sharper relief for me. We encounter him as the living echo and personification of ultimate reality, giving us the opportunity of encountering the intelligence behind the universe as the deepest combination of compassion, justice, mercy and hope, authenticating our own personalities and our personhood, saving us not only from ethical failure, sin and shame, but also the burden of fractured and wounded being. As St Augustine of Hippo put it, Lord, you made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find themselves in you. And the link with Augustine takes us, in fact, to another moment in history when civilization also hung in the balance, I think, in a way as it does today. As he lay dying in 430, the vandals were at the gates and by some act of synchronicity, there they are again. The vandals are once more at the gates but this time they are in fact at both the front gates and the back gates, especially of the church. Paul Kingsnorth, a philosopher, a recent convert to Eastern Orthodoxy, one of the more profound of our contemporary thinkers, is warning the church of a coming assault that we need to prepare for, which is beyond our present culture wars. We need prophets in the church, certainly, and Paul's one of the best philosophers. Former pagan, eco-activist, former Buddhist, he reluctantly became a Christian a few years ago. <clears throat> he embraced Eastern Orthodoxy and he went to live in the depths of rural Ireland. Who would not want to do that? He emerges from time to time through his writing, the internet, and last week in the, the Unheard Club in London, where they invited him to describe what he saw as lying beneath the dust cloud approaching the front gates of our civilization. At present, the culture wars we are fighting might be seen as the enemy at the back gates. There we face the invasion from secularism, this attack on Christian ethics and Christian anthropology is so very much last century. But the relativists, the anti-supernaturalists, the pragmatists are hammering away, trying to gain entry through their fifth columnists in the church and determined particularly to try to redefine gender, sexuality, sexual ethics. It is alarming how many theologically and spiritually obtuse Christians have surrendered to their self-indulgent secularism, but equally this may also be an indication of how thorough the brainwashing that the media and the education systems have been on us all. It's felt for some time this assault at our back gates, the immediate past, may threaten the very foundations of the Catholic faith itself. 
But they can only do that if they succeed in changing the magisterium. And that's where the present struggle, surprisingly enough, is focused. But Paul Kings North's warning us to prepare for the assault that's coming at the front gates. Although only a storm cloud at the moment approaching in the distance, it's more threatening than what we know at the back gates. What is the relationship between the two? The answer is if we surrender our defence of the sacred, our received epistemology, our guardianship of holiness, and our received Christian anthropology made in the image of God to the vandals in the culture wars, we'll have no platform remaining to resist the attack that's coming at the front gates from the oncoming demands of the high priests of artificial intelligence and transhumanism. Kings North, particularly in his role as an Orthodox Christian, looks backwards for authenticity not downwards or forwards, that's the gift of the East. And his message to the non-Utopians who gathered to hear him at the Unheard Club was that if they were looking to conserve the West, the West being only and ever the residue of Christendom, then they need to recognise there's nothing now left to conserve. It's over. The pace of social change has raced ahead of us, leaving us lagging a long way behind. Conservation isn't the issue of the moment. We are in fact engaged in fighting a full-blown revolution. He said, this is a revolution that's going to make the Enlightenment look like a tea party. Kings North plots the immediate future using a number of interesting stepping stones. The first one is arrived at by acquaintanceship with the French metaphysician and philosopher René Guénon, G-U-E-N-O-N, 1886 to 51. He became a Muslim and migrated to Egypt. He's also much admired by King Charles III, go figure. Guénon foretold that humanity, being wholly unable to shake off our inbuilt religious instinct, would instead transfer it to a different ultimate authority. And as the West entered the following century, the 20th century, it would enter a new area, the reign of quantity, one in which quantity mattered most. Religious feeling would also become a matter of quantity too, channeled into the material and materialism, think empiricism, by the force of our determined willpower. Jesterton shared the same intuitive instinct. He said, if you don't worship God outside the world, you'll end up by worshipping instead whatever the strongest thing is in the world. What is the strongest thing today? Well, it's technology. Kings North suggests these perceptions come together just at the moment that technology is presenting itself to us as the most powerful means of realising our dreams and our desires. He describes technology in this sense as the machine. And the machine is the material manifestation of the perennial human desire for liberation, the ultimate goal that we are attracted towards becomes, quote, the independent, rational individual freed from the obligations of both history, community and nature. Consumer liberalism has taught us, indeed indoctrinating us, that all, all desire is good and it's used to sell things. Desires become untethered from any ethics. Desire is the new unholy spirit. And Kings North warns the mixture of untrammeled, untrammeled egotistical desire and the leap forward in artificial intelligence, unbounded by moral or philosophical restraint of any kind, they've thrown off Christianity, will over overwhelm everything we know in both humanity and in nature. Transhumanism, artificial intelligence, the growing of food and babies in laboratories, transcending the transcending of everything from biology to gender, we're trying to break the limits and redefine nature itself, he said. Nor, unlike the vandals at the back gates who have tried to disguise the secular utopianism of their project, is the assault or project of the front gates hidden. All the people responsible for it are in full view and very open about what they're doing. Elise Bohan, B-O-H-A-N, is a well-known Oxford academic and she's pioneering 
the pursuit of transhumanism. She reflected how on at a conference on transhumanism, a biologist working at the cutting edge of the discipline murmured to her inner ear, We are building God, you know. I know, she answered. Ray Kurzweil, who earned a fortune developing computer voice recognition and is now Google's new director of engineering. All these people are in control of our institutions. When he was asked recently if God exists, he replied, not yet. They're working on it. Martine Rothblatt, a transgendered transhumanist, is one of the most vocal exponents of what she, he, she calls geoethical nanotechnology. The ambition of her project is to ultimately connect all consciousness and control the cosmos. Technology is ready to embark on building not only its own Tower of Babel, but its own cosmos of Babel. Rapidly, wrote Marshall McLuhan in the 1960s, we approach the final phase of the extensions of man, the technological simulation of consciousness, when the creative process of knowing will be collectively and corporately extended to the whole of human society. At the time, nobody really had much idea of what Marshall McLuhan was talking about. But suddenly, in 2023, we're getting a glimpse of what he meant. Ms. Rothblatt argues that sometime around 2050, about 100 years after McLuhan, we will have reached the point at which we can transplant digital copies of our minds into AI-ready operating systems. As Shahi approvingly writes in her book Virtually Human, The Promise and Peril of Digital Immortality, humanity is devoting some of its best minds from a wide diversity of fields to helping software achieve a mind, as well as figuring out how to digitize our own mind's uniqueness on the platform that's ready to go live or become conscious. This mind is what the transhumanists believe they are building as the new God. And that's the reason that Kings North insists that this is a revolution that's going to make the Enlightenment look like a tea party. The entire basis of what we understand by reality is being rewritten. There's nothing that can be agreed on, nothing that's sacred, nothing you can't change, nothing you can't make new, convinced that the world is our playground and that everything from history to human nature to sexual dimorphism can be changed if you feel like changing them or change back again if you want to do that, we are consciously making ourselves post-human. Aware that we're about to engage in a war for reality, King's North warns that this is at roots a new religious war. He says the challenge now is not about conserving or restoring, but it's to choose what your religion is. And if you don't choose, it will be chosen for you. You'll be absorbed by default into the new creed of the new age, which is the attempt to build God, to build the mind, and replace nature through technology. This is what Genesis called the path of the snake. If the Catholic Church needed to be made aware of how important it was to redouble its determination, to articulate clearly to the culture war vandals at the rear gates, the power and the authority and the unyielding commitment to revelation and to its vision of the sacred, particularly the sacred, sacredness of human life, King's North analysis suggests this would be the moment. The next assault on God, his church and the project of salvation is about to get even more serious and deadly. He recommended we pray, but at least we ought to understand exactly what the issues are, and perhaps we can redouble our efforts to hold off the vandals at the back as we prepare for an assault on everything we know about God, everything we know about humanity, everything we hold sacred and valuable about ourselves and redouble our commitment to our faith and all it means as we try to, be, to save what God has given us and to be faithful to everything he's entrusted us with. 
Let's pray indeed.